waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will turn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our gates a mighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our Good morning, everybody. And it's good to see everybody here today. Thank you for coming out and joining us. We had a beautiful snow this morning, and it was a good opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> somebody was applauding that. Oh, good. I love snow, too, but, and so does Todd. Todd just loves it. <laughs> We're uh, glad everybody is here today to be able to celebrate together and, and enjoy what it means to be the people of God. This is your first time joining us. Welcome. If you're in the room and it's your first time, there should be a Connect card in the pew rack in front of you. We'd ask you to take that and fill it out and let us know that you've been here. If you're joining us via live stream, welcome. You can go to the address that you will see on the screen and join us, and we will try to be in touch with you and let you know that we are glad that you have been here. But whatever the situation is, we are here as the people of God, and we are joining together for worship because our God is with us, and he loves us, and he wants us to be able to celebrate what it means to be his people. Today, we are the church. Let's watch this and be reminded of who we're meant to be. What is church? Is it a building? With some pews? A piano? And stained glass? Or is it something more? 2,000 years ago, the church was born. It wasn't made up of the famous, the rich, or the powerful. It was made up of everyday people who passionately believed in the message of Jesus. It was the beginning of a revolution of love and freedom that would change the world forever. In 369 AD, the church built the first hospital as a place to care for those who cannot care for themselves. Today, the church is the largest single provider of healthcare in history. The church was the first to stand up for the rights of children creating the first and largest orphanage system in the world. 100 out of the first 110 universities in America were founded as Christian institutions. Places like Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, and Princeton. Much of the world's greatest art, architecture, literature, and music has been shaped by the church. But the impact of the church isn't just ancient history. 
Today, the church is stronger than ever and continues to impact every corner of the world. Over 300,000 churches in America and almost 5 million churches around the world stand ready to be instruments of change, to do what governments could never do. Every day, the church brings food and fresh water to millions of people across the world. It has a renewed passion to help widows and orphans and fights to free slaves in every part of the world. It stands ready as a first responder on the scene to provide relief for victims of disaster. The ripple of Jesus' impact can be clearly seen and felt in the church today. And it's made up of people like me and you. Today, you didn't just come to a building. You came to a revolution 2,000 years in the making. The world is facing as much trouble as ever. But we are not afraid. We were created for such a time as this. We will continue to do what we've always done. Proclaim the message of Jesus to help a world that needs him so desperately. Welcome. 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 Welcome to church. Holy God, I thank you for the opportunity to be your church. I thank you for the opportunity to be a people who come together, who realize that we are called to be something extraordinary, something that's different, something that changes the world every place that it touches it with your love and grace. And so I pray, oh God, that as we gather in this place today, we will be reminded of what our mission is. We'll be reminded of what we are meant to do. We'll be reminded of the kind of people that we are called to be. And that we'll allow you to fill our hearts with your presence in such a powerful way that we can't help but become the kind of people that you would have us be to the world that's right around us. We live in a town that's full of people that are meant to be our neighbors. Help us to see ourselves as a neighborly people and help us to give that neighborly feel to others by showing them and telling them about a love that will never let them go and a love that truly has changed everything. Make us instruments of your peace and your hope and your love and your grace and your power and your change today and help us to know that you are here with us and you will never let us go. For it is in your name we offer a prayer. Amen. Our children are invited to come forward. There they come. There they come. <laughs> yes, Jesus loves me. Let me hear you. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells us so. Good morning. How you doing? Did you get excited about that snow this morning? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, no. <laughs> Callie doesn't like it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm not a snow. It was pretty, though, right? It was pretty. But you were disappointed, Jack, when it stopped? No, uh, you, you were glad it stopped, though. No, you like snow, and you... No, I like snow, she doesn't. Oh, okay, good. What about, what were you going to say? Well, I built uh, a snowman out of snow and uh, a small version. You built a snowman out of snow this morning, Isaiah? Was there enough? Uh, um, something from uh, a movie. Oh, It was from a movie, and it literally stood up. You built what? A clay snowman. A clay snowman. You guys are something else. I, I don't think I've built a snowman in years. Yes, sir. My mom built lots of snowmen. Your mom has built lots of snowmen, Nathaniel? I bet she's good at it, right? Yeah. Well, there wasn't enough snow this morning to build a snowman, but it was pretty, right? It was pretty, and you got excited, and then it stopped. And then it stopped, and I was glad. Okay, so look here. What's it look like I've been doing? Cutting hearts. Cutting hearts. Why would I be cutting hearts out? Because it's Valentine's Day. What is Valentine's Day all about? Somebody teach me. Josie, what were you going to say? What's about? It's about love. What were you going to say, Callie? It's about love. About God's love. Friendship. Friendship. What else? Nobody said candy. <laughs> You're right, it's not about candy, but who's getting candy for Valentine's Day? Anybody? I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know. Do you hope? My mom and dad don't tell me anything. <laughs> My mom and dad don't tell me anything, he says. <laughs> I mean, they just want it to be a surprise, I guess. Ayla, what'd you say about your birthday? Birthday's coming up soon, isn't it? Isn't it? Okay. Yeah, I was cutting out these Valentine's Day because everybody says it's about hearts and somehow it's about red. And I forgot to put my red tie on this morning instead of my blue tie. Does it matter? No, No, it doesn't matter. I don't need this tie anyway. So I tell you what, I cut out these hearts for you guys. And I want to talk to you about them before I give them to you, okay? So everybody's going to get a heart. Does that sound exciting, a paper heart? (laughs) Okay, look, there's no candy. Whoa, 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 whoa. There's no candy. Okay, so let me talk to you you about hearts. Um, So you said it was about love. Do you have anybody that you're going to write a love note to, a Valentine to, that you love a lot? My whole class, I have to. Your whole class, you have to? Okay, prescribed love for the whole class. For who? For anybody, everybody in your class too. How about somebody, somebody really special? Anybody really special? Who? My best friend. Your best friend. Are you gonna tell your best friend that you're really glad they're your best friend? You're gonna give them a Valentine or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. That used to be a big deal. Do what? Everybody. See, that's the way you do it now. When I was a kid, you know, we brought Valentines for our friends, and you know, do y'all remember when not everybody got a Valentine and it was sad? And so then we figured out that, okay, everybody needs a Valentine. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Valentine's Day is about love and it's about friendship. And we think of the people who are so special to us. And it's so important to, to tell them, right, Kelly, that, you know, I'm so glad you're my friend and I love you. But here's the real story. Who thought about love? God. It's God's idea. Everything starts with God. Everything starts with God. Love is God's idea. And so let's think about Valentine's Day as God's idea because he's the one who thought of love and boy is he the one boys and girls who showed us what love looks like does anybody know what John 3 16 in our Bible says what's it say that whoever thank you Ayla John 3 16 John 3.16 is a love note from God. It says God loved the world so much. That's what you got to remember. God loves the world so much and everybody in it that he gave. What did he give? His His one and only son. You don't have any kids yet, do you? Yeah. Woo, good. One day, maybe you'll be a mommy or daddy. You're not going to want to give that kid away, are you? No. No, no, no. But God loved us so much. And Jesus agreed, and he came, and he showed us how much he loves us. And boys and girls, now listen, this is what I want you to know. There is a space in your your heart that's carved out just for God. Now, nobody else can really fill that space that God designed in your heart for him. It's a Jesus-shaped space, like a puzzle would fit And God has given you his heart. And you know what God wants from you? Your your heart. Yeah, that's what he wants. He wants your heart. He wants your heart of trust. Oh, he wants us to trust him. He wants our heart of attention. He wants us to pay attention to him. He wants our heart of love. He wants us to love and trust him back. Now, boys and girls, I want you to think about this and pray about this. Talk to your parents about it. You know, there's going to be a time when you decide that you want to fill that space with Jesus, that that heart-shaped space with Jesus. And then you tell us about that, and we'll celebrate that, and you begin your life as a Jesus follower. Josie, I remember when you decided it was time to fill that space with Jesus, remember? And we went right up there, didn't we? And you were baptized. Remember that? You can help boys and girls understand that, can't you? Yeah. So think about people this week uh, that you love, and, and I want you to 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 decide who you're going to give this heart to. But even more importantly, I want you to decide, are you going to give your heart to Jesus? God's already given you his heart. Okay, so I want you to think about that. There you go. And if you see somebody that's hurting, somebody's sad, somebody needs help, maybe you think, hey, I'm going to give them this heart and remind them that God loves them, and I do too. That'd be a good way to be a neighbor, wouldn't it? Okay, hey, you know what? I love you.
I mean it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that love is your idea. And so this Valentine's Day, help us to enjoy uh, the Valentine's that we share in our classrooms and help us to enjoy the candy. And God, help us to remember that you, um, you've created a space in us that, that you want to fill with your love and you want us to give that love away. Show these boys and girls how to give not just these little paper hearts away, but to give your love away this week. Will you please and every day? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, see you next time. Let's go build a snowman. Praise Him 
my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. and the, the one little thing that you were able to do just didn't barely scratch the surface. It just didn't seem like enough. Well, I wonder if maybe that's how Charles Wesley was feeling when he wrote this next hymn. Um, Wesley wrote over 6,000 hymns, but this one he was writing on the anniversary of the day he gave his life to Christ. And the first words that he wrote was, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. One tongue just didn't seem to be enough to adequately express his gratitude and praise for the salvation that God had given him. I can't really imagine having a thousand tongues. Sometimes I have trouble controlling one tongue, right? But... When we as a body of believers combine our praise and there are other believers around town who are also singing their praise and there are other believers around the world who are also singing praise, more than a thousand tongues are lifting praise to our God. That's what it means to belong to the body of Christ. And it's not just our tongues that combine our we combine our financial resources and the ministries that we're able to do grow and we combine our energy and the people that we're able to teach about Jesus and and tell about his love are multiplied you know my voice by itself seems really small sometimes but when I combine my voice with all of your voices, we can fill the room with praise. Let's praise together. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing our great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His name. The name that 
charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and And we continue worship as we pray together. We close our eyes only to shut out distractions and we do our best to not be so aware of people around us. Striving to give our attention, our fuller attention to God, help us. Oh, help us, God. You know that our minds are so easily distracted. You know that we're weary in many ways. And you know that um, we even struggle sometimes to concentrate on you and to even be thankful. God, help it not to be such a struggle this morning. Remind us of your goodness, the goodness that's not only all around us this morning as we celebrate you in this beautiful, warm room, but the evidence of your goodness all across our lives as we look back. God, help us to look back and to remember how good you've been, how faithful you are, how merciful and kind, how very gracious Forgive me for the times that my tongue is not singing your praises, but uh, otherwise bringing discouragement or something negative or God forgive us when we concentrate too much on us. Thank you that you sent your son to show us just how focused you were on winning us. Just how focused you were on showing us the depth of your love. God, help us now to turn our attention to you. To trust you with not only our hearts, but the hearts of others that we love. To trust you with all those things that we can't fix. To trust you with all those people. that we feel like we can't help or fix. 
Help us, God, to be a valentine in action this week. Please, please show us how to practically love our neighbors, those who are closest to us, those within reach. Show us, God, and then give us a boldness, a courage, a devotion for you that compels us to reach out and to love without excuses, without hesitation. Oh, God, please make us into those people that you've designed us to be starting right here, right now, receiving your love so that we might share that love with others in the world, that changing, life-changing way. Jesus, help us as we pray this prayer to hear the words with our hearts, not just with our ears, and to, to speak them as we live when we leave this place. Join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll try to give my heart away for the days. I was just told a couple of minutes ago that our live stream has crashed this morning. The live stream was crashing, but we had sound until just a minute ago. Now we have no sound or anything else. And then on top of that, if things were not bad enough for you people in the room, I forgot to powder my head this morning, so it's unusually shiny today, so... You'll get, to, you'll get the joy out of all of that. I am pretty sure that our live stream's probably demon-possessed today, so we'll, uh, we'll just let, have to make do with that. Won't affect us in the room, but I hate it for the people that were joining us. We can't do anything about that kind of thing. Sometimes technology just does not work the way we want it to work. I may have told this story somewhere along the way. I don't remember for sure because I'm old. But the reality is, is I probably have told this because, number one, it's a true story, and number two, it makes a really good point. It reminds us that even good people with the very best of intentions can be tempted to do the wrong thing in the right situation by things that would normally not be too tempting for us. Anyway, King Duncan's a Methodist minister. He flew into Atlanta a few years ago to help lead a conference, and a friend of his had told him about a restaurant there in South Atlanta that was called the Church of God Grill. He told him that it was the best fried chicken that he'd ever had. King got there a little early and he was hungry and so he looked it up and found out that it was not that far from the airport and so he rented a car and he drove down to the Church of God Grill. He ordered their fried chicken and sure enough he said it was the best chicken that he had ever had in his life. When he got finished eating it, one of the servers came over to give him his check, and when he did, King asked him how the church, came, how, the, how the restaurant came to be known as the Church of God Grill. When he did, the man said, well, we used to have a mission down here, and the offerings weren't big enough to support the mission, and so we started selling chicken dinners in order to try to help pay the bills, and the people liked our chicken so well, we couldn't keep up with all of the orders, so we finally just closed the mission and turned it into a restaurant, but we kept the name because everyone knew us as the Church of God Grill. Now, think about that just a little bit. We had a mission, we had a church, we started selling chicken dinners, and we liked it so well we just kept doing it, and we closed the church. We hadn't thought about doing that here, you know. We've had this building, we, you know, we could have been making money all along down here. Somebody recommended years ago that we turn this place into a bar and grill, and it would help pay for the new facilities that we were going to build. I vetoed that. We may need to go back and rethink that. Yeah. What's the point of this story? Well, there are actually two points to this story. The first point is it's way too easy to lose our passion for our faith if we don't stay focused on what's really important in life. 
The Atlanta Church of God started a mission down there in South Atlanta because it wanted to be a good neighbor to a neighborhood that needed a, a missional church in their area. It was an impoverished neighborhood. It was a crime-ridden neighborhood. It was a drug-infested neighborhood. And so they wanted to put a mission there that would be an active missional neighborhood church. But unfortunately, the church couldn't pay its bills. And so they came up with a creative way to try to do that. And it was so successful that they stopped focusing on the mission and they started focusing on the money. And they justified that by saying that they were giving employment to people that wouldn't have employment if it was not for their restaurant that was there doing so well. They were right about that. It was not that that was not a good idea. But the problem was they lost the rest of their mission by becoming focused on material success. That's the first point of this story. It's easy to lose your passion doing the right thing if you become focused on the wrong idea in the midst of it. And that leads us to a second point of this story. And the second point is, it's a lot easier to lose sight of your mission than we think it is. It's a lot easier to get on the wrong track than we think it is going to be. In fact, you can lose sight of your mission even when you're focusing on all of the right things, even when you're focusing on doing good things. For instance, the picture that you're about to see here is the Second Baptist Church of Baltimore, Maryland. In its heyday, this was a powerhouse church. In fact, the famous Baptist missionary, Lottie Moon, was a member of this church at one time, and this church raised a huge amount of the money that she used to pay for the mission that she went and did in China. But the neighborhood around this church changed over the years, and it went from being a, a fairly well-to-do community to being a poor, inner-city, crime-infested neighborhood, and and the church had a hard time trying to keep up with that. They did the best they knew how to do, and many of the things that they did were very good. In fact, when Second Baptist Church closed its doors, it had one of the most powerful social outreach ministries of any church I've ever seen. It had its own community food bank. It had a clothes closet. It had a, its own Christmas store. It had a soup kitchen. It had a Meals on Wheels program to senior adults. It had a daycare for the, the, the children of the poor families that lived in the area. It had a night care that did nothing except to take care of the children of the prostitutes in that area. It had a tutoring program. It had an Alcoholics Anonymous program. It had a Narcotics Anonymous program. And it had a homeless shelter. It's hard to find a church that, that was doing more good things in its area than Second Baptist was doing. You couldn't have found a church that tried as hard to try to do good stuff for its neighborhood as Second Baptist did. But they only had about 60 members when they closed, and, and only about 40 of those were attending church on any kind of a regular basis. They had a sanctuary that seated 800 people, and so you can imagine how sparse it looked when anybody would show up there. And most importantly, the year that they closed their church, they had not had a single baptism in that church in over three years. That church did exceptionally good things for people, but in the process, they failed to tell people about Jesus Christ. They failed to tell people about the man that inspired all the good things that they were doing. They failed to keep up with the church's central mission to make disciples for Jesus Christ, and they just did something that a whole lot of churches do in our country these days. They made the assumption that if you were doing good things for people through your church, that people would understand why you were doing that, and that would make them want to come to your church and get involved. It would make them want to believe in Jesus. It sounds reasonable. It never works. It is not something that works on a daily basis because the central mission of the church is to make disciples for Jesus. You can do all kinds of good things 
and still fail in your central mission. And if you fail in your central mission, you will fail. The scripture that we're looking at today comes from Matthew 28. It's verses 16 through 20. It reads like this. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain that Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you grew up in church like I did, you're familiar with this verse of Scripture. I grew up in a Baptist church, and, and certainly this was one of the hallmark Scriptures that we studied and, and that we had to memorize as we were coming along. But what's interesting about this passage of Scripture is even though it's one of the most well-known Scriptures in the Christian church, it's also one of the least popular Scriptures in the Bible. There are studies that are done on that kind of thing every year, and this always comes up on the list of the least popular passages in the Bible. In fact, there are entire denominational groups and entire seminaries that have spent tremendous amounts of time trying to convince themselves that Jesus didn't actually mean what he said in this passage, that this passage really isn't about evangelism and disciple-making, it's about social justice and changing the structures of the world. Now let me just say, I'm all about social justice, and I really want to see a lot of the structures of the world change. Congress would be one of those. But the cold, hard reality is, this passage is not about social justice, and it's not about changing the structures of the world. This passage is about evangelism and making disciples. And if hearing that makes us uncomfortable, then that's probably a sign that we need to hear what Jesus was saying. This passage is called the Great Commission because that's what it was. Jesus looked at those 11 disciples and he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And I can just bet you a dollar to a donut that their response to that is exactly the same response that we would have today. They probably all started looking at each other and they said, what in the world is he talking about? We can't do that. There are only 11 of us. We're already a man down. We can't possibly do what he's saying that we're supposed to do. And I can just imagine Jesus looking at them and saying, yes, you can. That's why I picked you. Jesus knew these people could do it, and he knows that we can do it too because the Great Commission doesn't start with the world. The Great Commission starts with our neighbor. It doesn't start (coughs) with what seems the impossible. It starts with the person next door. It starts with the person that's right beside you. It starts with your family. It starts with your friends. That's what Jesus was talking about in Acts 1-8 when he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus was telling the disciples, Start where you are right now. Start in Jerusalem with your neighbor. Your first mission field is your neighborhood. It's right where you are. A few years ago, I had some people get really annoyed, really annoyed with me. When I said in a sermon that I was preaching, Blacksburg is our first mission field. I'm not really sure why that frustrated so many people so much that day. But I had people come, they wanted to argue with me that, that ministry here is just that. It's ministry to, to our own church. And then the mission field is something way out there beyond us. I understand what they're saying, but that didn't change the fact that they were wrong. They weren't wrong just because I said it. They were wrong because Jesus said so. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. There's a reason why Jesus started by telling his disciples that they needed to be witnesses in Jerusalem. He wanted them to start right where they were standing. This was their hometown. He wanted them to start at home, and that's what Jesus wants us to do in our lives as well. Our neighbor is our first mission field. 
there's a reason why Jesus started it in the town where they were in. And I'll be even more blunt as to say, we can't do adequate missions in India or in Nigeria or in Haiti or in Honduras or in the Dominican Republic or in any of the other places where our church actually does missions if we fail here. If we fail here, we fail. Jesus planted this church in Blacksburg 170 years ago this year. This is our Jerusalem. If we don't take our mission to our neighbor seriously, we're not going to succeed somewhere else. That's just common sense, folks. It makes a lot of sense if you think about it. There's not a church in the world that can do strong ministry in India if it's not strong at home. It takes strength to beget strength. No, those 11 disciples couldn't evangelize the whole world by themselves. But by making Christians out of their neighbors, they could multiply their efforts exponentially. On the day of Pentecost, there were 11 original disciples and about 100 other people that had gathered in the upper room of a house. And what we need to remember is they weren't up there planning ministries. They were up there praying and hiding. They were scared to death that they were going to be the next ones nailed to a cross. And yet, when the Holy Spirit came on those people, they came bursting out of that house and they preached a powerful message of repentance and faith to the people who were out on the street. And when they did, 3,000 people in Jerusalem, 3,000 of their neighbors were baptized into the faith. All of a sudden, that church grew from about 100 people to 3,100 people. Their strength was profoundly multiplied in that one day. The church in Jerusalem went from being a small, weak, scared, and hiding group of people to being a large, strong, missional group of people in one day. And those 3,100 went out from that place and they told another 3,100 and they told another 3,100 and the Great Commission started to grow and grow and grow right from that moment. But it all started with their neighbor. Their first mission was right there in Jerusalem and the success that they had in Jerusalem paved the way for all of the success that the church was going to have from that point forward, it was going to become not only a worldwide and world-changing event, but it was going to become the greatest threat that the Roman Empire had ever faced. And they never used a weapon against the Roman Empire. They never lifted a sword against another soul in that empire. The only weapons that they used was God's love, God's grace, God's power, and the story that they told about a man called Jesus Christ. Jesus is calling us to be missionaries to our neighbors. And you might want to take notice, folks. Nobody's threatened by us. Nobody in this town is threatened by what we are doing here. I wish they were threatened by it. I wish the world was a lot more threatened by the story that we happen to tell. We need to be ministers to our neighbors. We need to be missionaries to our own community. That's what the Great Commission has to do. It has to begin here. It's not about numbers. It's about caring about the people around us. It's about believing that the world changes when people change, and people change one soul at a time. We're called to become the church to our neighbor. We have to believe that our neighbor is whoever we meet. They are wherever they happen to be from, whatever they happen to look like, whatever place they come from, whatever mistakes they have made, our neighbor are the people that, they're the ones that are around us. Whatever their story is, Jesus can step into it and even make it better or change it completely and remodel it. Our neighbor is the person that God puts into our path, whoever that happens to be. I have just started talking to someone about faith in the last couple of weeks. It's an individual that I've known for a long time, but all of a sudden one event happened 
that, that focused all of us on something special. And that individual started asking me questions that he had never asked before, and it's opened the door to me to be able to sit and talk to him. He is a neighbor that God put in my path. And all I needed to do was be aware of the fact that something different was starting to happen, and I had a story to tell. The Great Commission grew exponentially, but it all started with a neighbor. Their mission was in Jerusalem, so was ours. Our goal is to try to make a difference in the world that we live. We can do that by bringing Jesus to the people around us because Jesus can change things for people. About a year before Second Baptist Church closed its doors, the pastor of that church, Bob Doerr, he asked a, another pastor, an African-American man, to come and lead the devotional service that they did every Monday at that daycare center. They had always just done a regular devotional service like we did. That African-American pastor, who was a friend of Bob's, came to that daycare, and, and he was going to lead them in the devotional of the day. But instead of just doing what they had always done, he reached in his pocket, he pulled out his New Testament, and he read 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, everything has become new. Then that African-American pastor told the story of how his mother was a drug addict and a prostitute when he was born, but she had a friend who just kept trying to get her involved in, in a church, and, and so she started going to that church, and when he did, the people of that church wrapped their arms and their hearts around her, and they continued to tell her about Jesus as they loved her and as they helped her take care of her child, and as a result, his mother became a believer and and she joined that church and she she got off of drugs and she stopped the life that she had had and, and she became the kind of person that he came to be very proud of as he got older in his life he that pastor invited all of those women who were at that event that day to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior there were 11 women there that day five of them made the decision to do that they were baptized the next Sunday at the African-American pastor's church. Those people went on to give their lives to Christ and to turn their lives into a story and to share that story with the next generation coming behind them. And person after person after person changed because of that one invitation that was given by a man whose family had been changed by the story told to them by a neighbor. Our town is our neighborhood. And Jesus is calling us to go to our Jerusalem and make disciples. Why? Because knowing Jesus changes things. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come to you today. Many of us have a firm and passionate belief that you can change us because we've experienced in ourselves. This past weekend, I went and I helped celebrate the birthday of the man who led me to faith. He's 90 years old now, and he's had better days, but in his better days, he reached out and he realized that I was struggling, and, and he stepped into that struggle, and he started telling me about the kind of God that I had never really heard much about. It was a God that loved me and cared about me no matter who I was or where I was from. It was a God that, that could bring me the peace of mind and peace of heart that I had never experienced. And by the time that man got through telling his neighbor about Jesus, I had accepted that Christ into my heart. And I'm who I am today because he cared enough about me to tell me the story. Lord, you change things. When we become one with you, it changes us. Lord, come to us today. Help some of us to receive you into our lives for the first time. Help us to have the courage to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I've never known what I was missing, and I may not even be sure what I'm missing now, but I think I'm missing you, and so I'm trusting you to come into my life and, and help me to be more than I've ever been before. Some of us need to make a commitment to actually be witnesses for you in the places that we work, where we go to school, to our next door neighbor, whoever it happens to be. Lord, inspire us today to be 
people who want to be children of God and help us to believe your love changes things forever. In your name I pray. Amen. Face lost in a crowd, feet wandering empty streets, voice crying out loud, heart aching with every beat, someone searching, searching for someone everywhere and endlessly. Wishing, waiting, could there be someone searching for, someone searching? So battered and bruised, pride wounded and left for dead. Ears deaf to good news, eyes tear drenched in sleepless red. Someone searching, searching for someone Everywhere and endlessly Wishing, waiting, could there be someone searching for Someone searching Oh, I hear the cries and I know been and will be someone searching love standing alone and scarred by the nails of hate hope suffering long faith urging that it's not too late someone searching searching for someone everywhere and endlessly loving longing always there's someone searching for someone searching searching for someone everywhere and endlessly loving longing always there's someone searching for someone searching someone searching You're here today because you've been searching and you've chosen to give your life to Jesus Christ or you want to and you're not sure how. If you'll come here to close the service, we'll help you with that. If you want to join our church and be part of our family, we would like to have you. If you will come down, we will help you make that decision as well and, and help you get started on your journey with us. This is a time in our history when we are being called to make a difference. We had a, one of our church members come to me after the 830 service and said, there's a group of young people that live next door to our house. They're all involved with the rescue squad. And there's a young man that lives on the other side, and he's single. And she said, I'm going to make cookies for all of them and take them to them. I'm go well, she said, I'm going to taste them, make sure they're fit to eat. Then I'm going to take them to them. And she said, and let that open the door to me being able to maybe say some other things to them along the way. Let's think about how we can be a neighbor to others. Let's do the best that we know how to offer the neighborly love of God to people around us. Today, before we leave, I have a video for you. It's, it's a day when we are recognizing our volunteers, and so watch this for just a second. Volunteers, we want you to know
know how very much we appreciate all that you do, whether that's on Sunday or during the week. Without you, it's really hard to keep Blacksburg Baptist moving forward and being the very mission-focused church that it is. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen. And thank you to all of you who make this place run every day. Pick up a gift.